Hi, welcome everyone here uh, in the black box uh, at Tilburg University. My name is Annelie Koster and I'm a program manager at uh, Studium Generale. And at Studium Generale we organize events like these lectures, symposia, etc. on campus and in town. You've all, I think, received this uh, leaflet with the upcoming events. So uh, if you think it's uh, of interest to you, then uh, you're well, very welcome to join. Today, uh, there is a lecture in our series, Introducing the Netherlands. That's a series of lectures that we organize together with ESN, the people from ESN <laughs> sitting over there. That's the International Student Association. Um, and these lectures are introduc introductions to t topics that uh, have a typical Dutch aspect, or might have a typical Dutch aspect. Today, it's about democracy because there are the elections, uh, local elections. Uh, actually, tomorrow is the official date, but it's also possible to vote uh, at some places today already. Um, and we have a, uh, a lecturer who is an expert on uh, local democracy, and that's Julien van der Staaien. And I think, Julien, you will introduce yourself a bit in your presentation. So very pleased that you're here, and welcome for to mm -hmm. Julien. Thank you very much. We'll be discussing democracy today on all levels, but mainly focusing on the local level because, well, as you've heard, uh, tomorrow, but also today, uh, there are local elections in the Netherlands. So a good opportunity, good time to talk a little bit about uh, democracy and how does the state structure of the Netherlands look like. I'll be doing that in, I think, somewhere in between 30, 45 minutes. I don't know exactly how long I will be talking, but somewhere in that line. And afterwards, there's, of course, time for questions and discussion, or if you have urgent questions in between as well. So my name is Julien van Ostaaien. I'm an assistant professor at Tilburg University, but also a professor of law and safety at Avans, University of Applied Sciences. And I've been looking into local democracy, mainly in the Netherlands, but also some comparative work uh, for about 20 years now. And on the right, you see uh, my latest book, uh, published a few weeks ago. Um, of course, I wanted it published just in time for the local elections in the Netherlands. It's a Dutch book, unfortunately, but I will, uh, in this short lecture, will give you some insight, I hope, on what local democracy and democracy looks like in the Netherlands. So let's start conceptual. So the main layers, levels of government in the Netherlands is national, provincial and local. And if you would visualize them, you could say, well, on the left, you see them pictured as a house because some actually say, well, it's actually a house because the top level is the most important. And then you have on the bottom, you have the local governments because they are the closest to citizens. Um, but maybe a better picture is the one on the right, because there's no real formal hierarchy between the three governments. So some say it's, they function like a body, like a human body. So the state is the body, but you have different parts of the body that are necessary to function. You need the heart, you need the brains. And if one of those stops functioning, well, the rest pretty much ends and dies as well. So that's also the way to picture or state structure. You have the state, three government layers, and all need to function, and there is some overlap in them as well. I said there's no hierarchy between them, but there is hierarchy in rules and regulations. So of course, when the national government makes laws or rules, then the other levels, provincial and local, are bounded, are, uh, they cannot ignore it. They cannot make their own rules or regulations that contradict the rules of the national government. But for the rest, they can do whatever they want as long as, it, as they uphold the law. Um, then I forget, before I will continue with this, these three levels, there's one 
more or less unique for the Netherlands that I forgot to mention, and that's this one, the water boards. We also have uh, a democratic level concerning water government. Um, and actually, it's our oldest form of government. We had those in the Middle Ages, small farmers that together discussed how to deal with water quantity and water quality. Um, at this moment, there are very large professional organizations. We had a few thousands of them ages ago, but now we have 21. And you can see them on the map where they are located. Um, and I've set them a little bit apart because the three levels I just mentioned, the province, the municipality, the uh, uh, national government, they all have autonomy, which pretty much means that you know, they can decide to take on new tasks. If they see new developments, for instance, in climate, uh, refugees, crisis, they can, of course, act on that. The water boards can't. They have a strict job description. So that's the difference between the water boards on the one hand and local, provincial, and national government on the other hand. But it's a democratic body. So we also elect not only our national uh, representative body, our provincial uh, representative body, local, municipal council, but we also elect the water boards. Um, it has been researched, if you want to know how they function and if you know, they provide good, good work. Um, in 2014, there was an OECD research, so European uh, Research Institute, actually saying, well, they function quite well, those water boards in the Netherlands, with some attention points. So a lot of citizens also in the Netherlands are not aware of what they do and what they are. So if you don't know them, um, well, don't blame yourself. People that have lived here in the Netherlands for a long time also are not really aware of what these uh, water boards do. And also on supervision and a few other aspects, there were some points of attention. But interested to take a look, uh, something that is not completely unique. They are visible in some other countries, but not a lot. And it fits our history because we have a history in, uh, uh, with water as uh, water that helps us, that enables us uh, for a lot of good things, but also has been regularly a threat, for instance, which you can see on the picture there when the water quantity becomes too large. But for the rest of the remainder of this lecture, I will focus on these and mainly on local government, but let's discuss national government, provincial government briefly. Um, be amazed at this, at first sight, complicated drawing. This is a drawing from Prodemos, Prodemos, at Huis voor Democratie en Rechtsstaat, Huis voor Democracy and the Rule of Law. It's a Dutch organization that actually promotes democracy and the rule of law in the Netherlands, for instance, for young children. I think it's a very good organization, but I'm quite biased. I've worked there a couple of years ago um, to support the goal. And what they do in this drawing, actually, they wanted to show, well, pretty much all the levels I just mentioned and how they are established and how they function. Well, I can understand it's pretty much uh, too, uh, a lot to grasp uh, at once, um, but they're all in there. The water boards are on the left. You have uh, the municipality over here, the province. On top, you have uh, national parliament and even European parliament and government. But for now, it's important to remember from this picture that in the end, all of those levels, and I will discuss them uh, after this slide, actually are all based upon citizens who vote. So they all have representative councils for which most people, most Dutch people can vote. And sometimes also non-Dutch people, but we'll get back to that in a minute. So Pro Demos, if you want, you can check it out on the internet. I think they have some English information as well. So let's start with national government. Uh, we have parliament, and parliament consists of two chambers, like in many countries. The most important one in the Netherlands is called the second chamber, which is somewhat confusing maybe, but well, let's not go into much detail about it. It's on the top left. So instead of showing you all the pictures of the heads, I thought maybe it's interesting to show you where they are located and in what rooms they meet and negotiate. So you have the second chamber 
on the left, and we also have a, well, what in the international literature is called a second chamber, but the second chamber in the Netherlands is actually called the first chamber, to make it a little bit more confusing. But in, um, I think you will be more familiar with the term the Senate. So you can actually call that the Senate. So we have the second chamber on the left, which is directly elected by Dutch citizens. The first chamber of the second chamber is 150 people. The first chamber, the Senate on the right, 75 people. And that gets elected indirectly by the provincial representative bodies. So we as Dutch citizens choose the provincial um, representative body and they elect then the first chamber, the Senate. And we're a coalition country, which means that our government consists normally out of a coalition of political parties that together have a majority in at least the second chamber. Well, we just had a new government, so I won't, we'll, I won't test you on all the new ministers, but you might know him, Mark Rutte, our prime minister, because he's been there for 10 years already. This is his fourth uh, government that he's leading, and also from a European perspective, he's one of the uh, longest um, government leaders active now. I think together with Orban from Hungary. So that about national government. Then we have, of course, the provinces. And I hope you all are, are aware of the province we're in now, which is Brabant. Um, and the rector, the boss, so to say, of the university, Wim van der Donk, formerly was also leading um, the Brabant government. And, well, the provincial government has all kinds of tasks. I cannot give, that would be, if, if I would test you, then this would be my question. I cannot give an exclusive list of tasks the province performs. Why is that? Does anyone, if I may ask you a question, does anyone know who has paid attention so far? You come close. You're saying there's a list that the, 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 what the national government should do and, well, other things that the others should do. It's um, what, how it works for the provincial government and the local government is they get a few tasks. So the law gives them several tasks they have to do. But apart from those tasks, they can choose everything they want to do, except if it, and that's, a few, what I said a few slides ago, if it goes against uh, rules or regulations from national government, or in the case of local government, if it also contradicts provincial government rules and regulations. But in general, provinces in the Netherlands deal with things like infrastructure, public transport, uh, spatial planning, climate, nature, things like that. The use of the provinces, do we actually need provinces? That's been a discussion that, you know, once in a while is being waged. And I don't know, I, I assume there are people from different uh, countries here. You might know that from your own country as well. In Belgium, for instance, let's start close by. Also, you know, the level between the local and the national government, it's always once in a while become is questioned. You know, do we need them? Are they, you know, can the local government do it? Can national government do it? And we see that in the Netherlands as well, once in a while. But on the other hand, it seems that the, the provinces function relatively well. At least, you know, no cases of big uh, mismanagement or controversy. They also don't deal with a lot of money. So they, they, they are re relatively modest in what they have to do. And then we'll go to local government. We have 345 municipalities at the moment. But if I speak really slow, then, I might, then this is probably outdated. Because in the Netherlands, it goes quite quickly. In some countries, again like Belgium or, for instance, Denmark, there is, in the history of those countries, you know, one moment in history where they chose to change the structure. And for instance, instead of having 2,000 municipalities, let's go to 500. 
Um, and you can see that in several countries, in Europe, but also uh, abroad or further away. But in the Netherlands, it's pretty much every year a few municipalities decide to amalgamate, to merge. Sometimes because they want to do that themselves, sometimes they're stimulated by, and I, I will put this mildly, stimulated by provincial or national governments. So the number is decreasing. So if you hang around long enough, you will see that 345 will also be outdated. Again, also the local governments have two tasks. They have to do what they have to do uh, from law, based on law, for instance, because the national government make laws forcing municipalities to do some, some certain things. Um, and they can also take on challenges that they find or see as necessary. For instance, building neighborhood houses, giving shelter to refugees, etc., etc. Insofar as it's not been regulated, local governments can also do those kinds of things. And you can see that in, in the Netherlands, municipalities do all kinds of things, from housing to safety to in the environment, to public streets, to playing grounds, etc. And from a European perspective, again, they're quite substantial. So in France, for instance, you have a lot of municipalities. They're quite small, but they don't, local government there doesn't really have a lot of tasks. It's, well, ceremonial is maybe a little bit exaggerated, but it comes close. In the Netherlands, they have a really uh, a large amount of, of money, relatively speaking, and uh, many important jobs that they have been decentralized from the national level. And also what is different from some European countries is that we get a lot of money from national government. And with we, I mean the municipalities. So much of the money that is spent on the local level is coming from national taxes. And also that is different in other countries. In America, for instance, the United States, uh, local governments have to earn the money mostly themselves. In the Netherlands, that is not the case. So let's talk a little about local elections um, because, well, that's what's happening right now in the Netherlands. Once every four years. And interestingly, you don't have to be Dutch to vote. However, you do have to live in the Netherlands for five years. So I don't know anyone here meets the criteria. I've been living here for at least five years. But not everyone, well, a few of you have, others not. Uh, well. Don't worry, there's another election I will talk about in the end that you will be able to vote for. Dutch voters have little interest and knowledge of local democracy. And now maybe with even you know, big issues like COVID and the war in Ukraine, maybe people are even less inclined to think about local democracy. But also in other years we see that people in the Netherlands Again, if I apply a European perspective, we see that in the Netherlands, people are less attached to the municipality. In some other countries, people really, you know, in their identity is really connected with the place they, uh, uh, they live, the locality, the municipality they live. In the Netherlands, it's less so. Maybe also because in the Netherlands, municipalities are quite large. 40,000, 50,000, well, I think 40,000 on average which is in the top five of European uh, countries. The largest is the UK, where the municipalities are, on average, they have more than 100,000 inhabitants, but I already mentioned France, and there are other countries in which the municipalities, on average, are small, with a small number of inhabitants. And that maybe has something to do, the large municipalities, with the identity, or the, 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 the feeling of the Dutch, a little bit less connected to the municipality than people in other countries. Well, and you can see that in the elections or the turnout. We have a turnout of about, well, I will come back to that in a minute, but about 55%. Um, and something we also see in local elections is that people vote not only for local reasons, but sometimes also take national motives to the local elections. So they don't vote locally for party A or party B because that party has the best plans in their eyes, in their view. 
for that municipality, but sometimes they think, well, you know, I don't know, really don't really know what all those parties stand for locally, but I do know that this particular party, which is often also a national party, um, represents my interest on the national level well, because they have a good point of view regarding taxes or defense or refugees. So I don't know what they stand for locally, but I will vote for them in the local elections anyway. We can see those kinds of things uh, in the Netherlands when we, we, we look at and we ask people for why do you vote uh, for this particular party on the local level. And last, we have a steady decline in turnout after the abolishment of um, compulsory voting or compulsory turnout. We, we see that, for instance, in Belgium, uh, there are still, they have to come to the voting booth. You don't have to vote, but you have to show up. In the Netherlands, we have had this in the past, but the last 50 years, we don't. In Flanders, by the way, it's also going to change for the local level. So, well, some scientists have been asked, you know, what will be the future of voting in, in Flanders on the local level? And pretty much, well, what you could say is, well, turnout probably will decrease when people don't have to show up anymore. So how does it look like in the Netherlands? Well, this is a the turnout in local elections last 50 years or so. So you can see a decline. So it's about 70% in the 70s uh, and about, you know, around 54, 55% now. But you can always play with figures. I always tell my students. So if you would stretch it a little, look, it becomes much more steady. You just, I just made the decline disappear. Uh, if you look at the last 30 years, and this is actually to show you the comparison to the other, to some other forms of government in the Netherlands, you can see it's not the most popular election. That is for the second chamber, or the national parliament. Um, any idea what the turnout, uh, what ref reflects, what is reflected by the bottom two lines? So the one with the uh, triangles, anyone who wants to guess? So the green one are the municipalities, and then you see the top one is national parliament, which is the triangles. The water elections could be, but it's, I haven't included that one on this. So it is not the water board, excuse me? No, that's the bottom one. So the one, the, the triangles are the provinces. No, European, I don't know how it's in, 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 in the places where you are come from, but in the Netherlands, the European Parliament elections are not that popular. Only the water board is even more unpopular. But funny thing maybe is when we talk about the water board elections, so um, they scored about 10, 20%. And what they've done now recently is they have coupled them or connected them to the provincial election. And what did we see? The turnout increased immediately. So a lot of people were happy with that. I would also ask the question, okay, turnout is larger now for the water boards, but do you think that people, all those extra 10, 20% of people that now do vote for the water boards really think about, you know, how to make uh, a smart choice? Well, maybe you're not, I mean, you're allowed to vote without thinking, but I would also encourage also people when, you know, we're talking about turnout and making people come to the voting booth, also try to, to make them think about what they, cho uh, what they choose and why. And on the last slide in which I want to show, well, mainly that you can play with statistics, is if you like a positive image about turnout in the Netherlands, then I, own, I would say only look at the last couple of local elections. And you can see an increase in turnout from 2014 to 2018. Well, it's 1% still, but if you, you know, stretch your graph uh, uh, long enough, then it really sounds like a big deal. Nevertheless, I think if you, you cannot ignore the decline. So at the moment, we made it, we abolished uh, compulsory voting, we could see the decline. If you would look at the television tomorrow, today or tomorrow, uh, to see what the results were of the local elections this year, then you will probably see something like this. So
So national TV will talk to you and will tell you what the national trends were. They won't tell you what the, I mean, they cannot go into the detail of all 345 or actually 333 because there are elections in 333 municipalities in what all the results were there, but they will discuss trends. And what they always will do is they will say, what do, does this mean for national politics? So what does the result for local elections, for local municipalities, what does that have to do with national politics? Party leaders are asked to give an explanation why their party lost on the local level, because many parties that are in the second chamber in, in the national parliament have local departments in many of those municipalities. Um, so in the media, you will see a lot of national attention and national explanation about something which is, in essence, a local um, activity. Good. And then what? After the election. So let's talk about this municipality, Tilburg. So we have, well, these are the parties now. Well, in a few days we will know what the scores of the parties are in this election. And I've already mentioned we're a coalition country, so that means that normally parties look for other parties to f together have a majority in the representative body. So in Tilburg, which is the seventh largest city in the Netherlands, we have 45 councilmen, which is um, the largest amount a municipal council can have in the Netherlands. So the biggest municipalities like Tilburg have 45 councilmen, councilwomen, and they will look for a coalition that is probably has 23 or more councilmen. And then they will form a day-to-day -day government. And the day-to-day -day government of Tilburg looks like this now. You can see the municipal council on the left, and then the day-to-day -day government, the municipal board of mayor and alderman on the right. And you can see it's a recent picture because they all stand at least one and a half meter away from each other. Um, there are two things I want to point out, and then we'll, we'll go to the end of this presentation, about the board. First is this, this guy, that's the mayor. And the mayor is the one person within the board of mayor and alderman that is not being um, nominated by political parties after the election. So after the elections, you have the coalition, a few parties that together want to form the government of the city, the municipal board, and they will nominate aldermen, which is pretty much for most political parties the biggest prize you can get in the election. I mean, it's nice to be in the municipal council, but if you're part of the day-to-day -day government, then you can nominate one of your party members as alderman, which is an important function as well. The mayor who heads the government is formally appointed by national government. We are unique, uh, Belgium has it, and I think maybe Bulgaria has it as well, uh, but not a lot of European countries um, have this system, but I explicitly say formally, because informally the national government only um, approves of what local government chooses. So the municipal council chooses every six years, they will, by holding interviews, by having a job, uh, well, they actually just say, well, we have a job opening for mayor. You can, if you want, well, uh, let us know and write a good motivation letter and we might even, uh, will nominate you as mayor. But this has nothing to do with the elections. But still, he heads um, the local government. So formally appointed by national government, practically the municipal council decides who becomes mayor. And in Tilburg, there's also another thing I would like to point out, and this is this woman, this lady, which is actually a former colleague, former employee of the university, and she was not affiliated to any of the political parties. Well, so what the other parties di did, they said, well, we want another alderman, and we want a neutral alderman. So they also actually held job interviews, and one of our former employees of this university actually was then added as the last alderman. She's not neutral anymore, so if you cycle through Tilburg or you, or you look at the, um, 
the campaign posters you will see her now as leading the list for GroenLinks, Green Left, a left party in uh, the Netherlands, because in the four years that she was alderman, well, she still is, of course, she actually said, well, I actually, Green Left is the party that suits me best, and now she says, well, I want to lead that list in the elections. And she, as a former employee of uh, Tilburg University, is a good bridge to the last slide, because democracy can become can come even closer than the municipality. It's also here in this university. And in April we have university, we have election, I think, uh, once again, um, for the university council and the faculty councils. And on the website of Tilburg University you can find students and employees contribute to thinking, discussing, and deciding on Tilburg University's policies. Um, and we can vote for the university council and the faculty council. Uh, and I can vote as an employee, I will vote for one of the employee parties, but you as a student can vote for one of the student parties. And in the university council we have two at the moment, Front and San. So they will probably, well you will see them if you are here in a few months time, you will see them trying to get your vote. Um, well you probably now see the councilman, but in a few, months time you'll see much younger people on average asking for your vote for the university and uh, faculty uh, councils and, and what are these councils well you have the government of the university and for the faculty the dean the rector with some government members but you also have these councils and these councils are well elected by us and they have advisory tasks so they can give advice on for instance if they want to hire a new professor then you can give advice on the profile, how does this person should look like, what qualities should he or she have. But for instance, also when, it's, when we're talking about education, new courses, but also changing examination, then the, the faculty council also will have to give advice or even a decisive vote. Um, I, have, I was a councilman for a few years in the faculty council, the Tilburg Law School, and my impression was, for what it's worth, um, that there are a lot of advisory tasks. So you don't get a decisive vote in everything that goes on in the faculty of the university. But my impression was that it was always taken very seriously. So if you gave advice on things that you wouldn't even you know, have a final vote in, then I, my impression was that you know, the people in charge always took that very seriously. And in that way, as an employee or as a student, you really could influence also policy from the faculty and from the university. So I would advise you, if you can, of course, also vote in April for the university elections, and perhaps if you're entitled to also for the other elections in the Netherlands or in your own country, please do. I think uh, now uh, more than ever is a good time to express how important that is. So I will just end my uh, brief introduction here. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention, and of course, there's room for questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Are there any questions from you? Yeah, I see a hand here. Hi, hi. Um, so in regards to your comments regarding the, like the university elections and whatnot, um, how would you try and explain to people who don't know or care about them why they are actually relevant throughout the years? Because we all know that, for example, whenever initiatives or whatnot are submitted by Font and some, it takes like two or three years for them to actually happen. And because of that, people are kind of like, oh, there's no point in voting because by the time it actually gets pushed through, I've already graduated. Um, but how would you kind of try and make that more relevant to those people? Well, I would say two things, that it's not always that it has to take two or three years. Sometimes, for instance, a change in um, the examination rules, that can be quite quickly. I've, I've experienced it a couple of times that, you know, in one year, there were substantial changes in the rules or regulations of you know, what counts as a sufficient grade, how many uh, resits were possible. So th those are things that if you decide upon them, unless you are on the verge of graduating yourself, but otherwise you can have effect on things 
that also affect you. And the other one is, well, okay, some things might even be, um, be in effect when you already left university, but does that exclude, does that mean that you are excluded from the obligation or at least the possibility to also make, make the university and the faculty better for people that, you know, come, uh, that, that follow you, you that, 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 that have to take the course a, the year after. I always do that in my uh, teaching evaluation as well. I mean, please give me uh, feedback so I can make the course even better for the people that will enter university and the faculty next year. And that's actually also what you should do in the faculty and the university. I mean, I think it's quite good now, but it can always be improved. Improve it for yourself, but also improve it for the people that uh, are somewhat younger and will enter university a bit later. Uh, so my question is more about the voting process because I want to make some kind of a comparison with my own country. Uh, where do citizens usually go to vote? Because, for example, in my country, uh, the elections are organized in schools. W what is your country? Romania. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make some kind of a comparison. Between. Okay. And you, you explicitly mentioned schools, so you want to know what kind of buildings and yeah, what kind of... Yeah, if they go to the municipality, for example, or if they are organizing okay. some other buildings. Well, organizing the elections um, is a local uh, competence. So for the local elections, but also for provincial elections or national elections, it are the municipalities that organize them. So the municipalities decide more or less in general where the voting booths are located, how many there are and where they are. So in the Netherlands you see, well, we have one you know, next door. So we have one in the university tomorrow uh, next door. You see them a lot in more or less public buildings, neighborhood associations, schools as well. Um, but there's also a trend last, well, let's say the last couple of years to have attractive um, locations. So, for instance, in the theater or in uh, 013, which is, you know, the pop, uh, uh, the, 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 where, you know, where, where the music is being performed uh, in, the, in the inner city or a museum. Um, some locations are, of course, questionable. So churches, once sometimes you see it's in a church, but there's a lot of discussion about it. So that generally isn't, isn't what uh, municipalities choose for because of, well, you want to have more or less neutral uh, locations. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's a municipal competence and most of the time it's in public places or places that are somewhat easy accessible. If you want to know more, we can discuss that later as well, if you want to do a research about this. Uh, I also have a follow-up question. For example, can you vote through mail? Like, uh, I personally, I have received a few weeks ago a letter uh, with the candidates, I believe. I didn't really read it because I knew I couldn't vote. So, <laughs> but can you vote to mail? To, oh, mail. no. Yeah, you can. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm doubting now because it was, yeah, I think it can be now because Yeah, we because if I remember correctly, I, re I also received like um, um, space in the letter where I can write my own choice, I think. So, well, and send it back after. I don't I'm know not if sure that's why. I think now since COVID, we also allow a voting by mail. I think it's also in this election. But what you also find in, in, in that instruction form is also a form in which you can make someone else vote for you. So if you are, for instance, you can't vote because well, you're sick or there is some, something that hinders you from voting, you can also give someone else there are quite some restrictions to it, but you can some give someone else um, the possibility to vote in your behalf. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Maybe, uh, Julien, you told us that um, uh, for the local elections here in the Netherlands, 
people tend to uh, look at the national issues and, and, and make that choice. I was wondering, is that something really typical for the Netherlands or is that somewhere, is that in other places the same? It's, it's difficult to say because, well, what is maybe typical for the Netherlands is that we do a lot of research into uh, to voting. Um, but you, you, see, you see similar trends for as far as uh, we know. Um, in the Netherlands, the local elections are what is called in the literature second order election. So it's not the most important election. Well, in, in most countries, local elections are second order elections because national parliament are often the first order elections. And a typical characteristic of second order elections is that sometimes, you know, motives from other forms of government are taken into account. So I think this is also what is happening in several other countries, but I don't know to what extent exactly. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. My question is whether there is like a geographical distinction, like if there are some regions that consistently vote for some parties and other region for others? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, for instance, in the southern part of the Netherlands, local parties are quite popular, and local parties are parties that are not affiliated to a national party. So parties that are not part of a party that is in parliament as well, but are only active in one municipality. But for instance, in the Netherlands, we have also called something like the Bible Belt. So we have a pretty much a belt around the Netherlands in the middle, more or less, in which uh, the vote for religious parties is quite large. Um, in the northern part, socialist parties are a little bit stronger. So you can see all kinds of those regional differences. Even in a country as small as the Netherlands, we have regional differences in preference of uh, voters. OK. No more questions, I guess. OK, thanks very much again, Julien van der Staaien, and uh, great to you here. Thanks. You're welcome. Nice to, uh, to, have, uh, to have you here. Thank you.